all um, so much for coming tonight. Um, I'm Eric Wakin. I'm the Robert H. Malott Director of the Library and Archives and the uh, Deputy Director of the Hoover Institution. And it's my great pleasure to welcome you to tonight's event celebrating the opening of our exhibit, We Shot the War, Overseas Weekly in Vietnam. Um, I'm going to introduce our panelists and our distinguished guest speaker in a moment. But let me uh, spend just a couple of minutes doing some thank yous and talking about the exhibit um, and about the institution. Um, First, let me thank the director of the institution, Thomas Gilligan, for all of his support for the library and archives over the last three years, and the overseers of the Hoover Institution, our board of directors. Everything we do is privately funded, and without the support of our overseers and other donors to the institution, nothing we do would be possible. Um, I also want to thank Lisa Wen, the curator of the exhibit, and all the people who helped put the exhibit together, helped us get the collection to the institution. Um, my colleagues, Samira Bazorgi and Marissa Ree, who put together the exhibit, um, my Library and Archives colleagues, uh, Overseas Weekly reporter and Pacific Bureau Chief Don Hurst, Art Greenspawn, Brent Proctor, Thorina Rose, Peter McDowell, Kate Steffens, Cynthia Koppel, who's on the panel also. Um, we're here in this wonderful Traytel building because of the vision of one man, Herbert Hoover, a uh, Stanford graduate who endowed what was then the Hoover War Library 100 years ago with a $50,000 donation. In today's purchasing power, that's about $700,000. His deed of gift was a telegram, collect material on war, with a few other words. From that kernel has grown this wonderful institution um, that um, has become the world's largest organization dedicated to documenting war, revolution, and peace in the 20th and 21st centuries. Indeed, the full name of the institution is the Hoover Institution on War, Revolution, and Peace. And so in addition to uh, a robust public policy research center dedicated to ideas defining a free society, 200 fellows, resident and non-resident in fields like economics and history and political science and literature, um, we have this renowned library and archives. So it's this wonderful institution that's a combined public policy think tank and library and archive. Founded, I might point out, as a library 20 years before the National Archives because of the vision of Mr. Hoover. And one of the things Mr. Hoover said was, this institution is not and must not be a mere library, but must dynamically point the road to peace, personal freedom, and the safeguards of the American system. And that's what we do. We collect materials, we describe them, we make them available, we offer fellowships, we teach classes, we sponsor research, we hold workshops, and we put on wonderful panels like this with these distinguished participants. So let me tell you a bit about the exhibit, which you're all going to see in a, at the end of the, um, the uh, presentation tonight. Uh, we Shot the War features photographs submitted to Overseas Weekly's Pacific Edition um, a military tabloid beloved by troops and reviled by the Pentagon for its controversial content. Long thought to be lost, the 20,000 of the newspaper's photographs and negatives and contact sheets arrived at Hoover in 2014. Mm. The Overseas Weekly compliments the institution's significant holdings on Vietnam, from the papers of Edward Lansdale to the manuscript of Ron Kovics, born on the 4th of July, uh, to the records of Sybil Stockdale who coordinated the National League of Families of American Prisoners in Southeast Asia and was the wife of Vice Admiral James Bond Stockdale, held as a prisoner of war in North Vietnam from 65 to 73, and subsequently also a Hoover Fellow. Um, the exhibit features photographs by Art Greenspawn, Richard Boyle, Ann Bryan, Cynthia Koppel on today's panel, Don Hurst, Brent Proctor, and other photojournalists. Um, the exhibit also features some of uh, James Stockdale's prisoner of war correspondence, propaganda leaflets, and a short film on the Battle of Hue. Uh, for those of you who don't know about Overseas Weekly, and I, I know you asked for how many people <laughs> uh, were affiliated with it in the audience, it was founded in 1950 in Frankfurt, Germany, by another great Stanford alumnus, Marion von Rosbach, and was a landmark venture in wartime reporting, serving as an alternative to Stars and Stripes. Um, its Pacific edition, which reported from Saigon, began in 1966, and it took a year-long battle and some lawsuits against the Pentagon before it was allowed to be sold on military newsstands. Overseas Weekly was eventually distributed and became known as, quote, a friend to the GI, and its tagline was, a touch of home away from home. 
It was the best-selling privately owned newspaper published in Europe and Asia for members of the armed forces overseas between 1950 and 1974. That's quite an accomplishment for a startup newspaper. Now, allow me to introduce our, our um, uh, panelists with some abbreviated biographies. I'll begin by um, uh, James Ellis. We're honored to have Admiral Jim Ellis as his distinguished fellow at the Hoover Institution, a 1969 graduate of the United States Naval Academy. Admiral Ellis was designated a naval aviator in 1971. His service as a fighter pilot included two tours with two fighter squadrons and assignment as commanding officer of an F-A-18 strike fighter squadron. In 1991, he assumed command of the carrier USS Abraham Lincoln. Um, I'm not going to go through his entire career, but his distinguished career has included serving as carrier battle group commander, leading contingency response operations in the Taiwan Straits, Commander-in-Chief U.S. Naval Forces Europe, Commander-in-Chief Allied Forces Southern Europe. Admiral Ellis also led the U.S. and NATO force in combat and humanitarian operations during the 1999 Kosovo crisis and completed his Navy career as commander of the United States Strategic Command. Jim's going to offer introductory remarks before the panel. Our moderator, Fred Turner, is the Harry and Norman Chandler Professor and Chair of the Department of Communications at Stanford University. Among his books are The Democratic Surround, Multimedia and American Liberalism from World War II to the Psychedelic 60s, and Echoes of Combat, the Vietnam War in American Memory. Before coming to Stanford, Professor Turner taught at Harvard and MIT and was a journalist for over 10 years. Cynthia Koppel, two seats over from, from Fred, was a war correspondent in South Vietnam in 1969. Stations in Saigon, she traveled throughout the country covering the war for the Overseas Weekly. Uh, returning in the 1970s, she was a publicist for Bay Area bands, Grateful Dead and Van Morrison. Since 1982, she's been director of Lotus Holistic Health Institute in Santa Cruz. She's also the author of Know Your Blueprint, The Ayurvedic Secret to Restoring Your Vitality and Passion in 30 Days, and she's a Cal graduate. <laughs> uh, next, to, <laughs> next to Fred, is uh, Mai Elliott. Mai is the author of The Sacred Willow, Four Generations in the Life of a Vietnamese Family, a personal and family memoir, which was nominated for the Pulitzer Prize. The New Yorker magazine called her family memoir, quote, as engrossing as fine literary fiction and indispensable to understanding Vietnam from a Vietnamese perspective. Her second book is Rand in Southeast Asia, a history of the Vietnam War era. Um, Mai Elliott served as an advisor to and appears in the Ken Burns documentary, The Vietnam War. Uh, Mai was born in Vietnam and grew up in Hanoi and Saigon. She's a graduate of Georgetown. Uh, uh, taking up the right uh, end of the panel is Phil Joya. After graduating from VMI in 1967, Phil was commissioned a second lieutenant in the Army. His 10 years of active service included two infantry combat command assignments in Vietnam, service as a combat infantryman, ranger, pathfinder, and master parachutist. He's a recipient of two Purple Hearts, two Silver Star Medals, and the Bronze Star Medal with the V for Valor. He also holds the Soldier's Medal for rescuing a woman trapped in a burning car in Washington, D.C. Uh, Phil is the director of the National World War II Memorial in Washington, D.C., an advisor on military history to the Presidio. He also appears in the Ken Burns documentary series, The Vietnam War, and holds advanced degrees from Georgetown and Stanford, and has been a mayor of his hometown of Corte Madera. So we'll begin with remarks by Jim Ellis. We'll transition after applause to our panel, but please give everyone a warm welcome. <laughs> And uh, I'd like to add my welcome to that that uh, Eric so articulately uh, uh, delivered to each of you. We really appreciate your participation in this. I think it's going to be an enjoyable afternoon, and, and I personally am looking forward to it. Uh, the war in Vietnam began for me on February 1st, 1973. I know that because I got my flight logbook off the shelf of my Hoover office and opened it, and that's the day uh, that the first uh, entry in the logbook began in green ink. And green ink is the way the military aviation describes combat missions. And I, there are only two pages there, and I want to make sure that I point that out. My service uh, does not hold a candle to those of Phil and, uh, and the tens of, actually hundreds of thousands of others who served through the duration of that uh, long conflict. Uh, since there was no declaration of war, the exact dates are sketchy on that, but uh, it's now widely accepted that the Vietnam War started on November 1st, 1955, and lasted until April 30th, 1975, which is roughly 20 years, or to be more accurate, 19 years and 180 days. American involvement in Vietnam began as early as 1950, when President Truman sent military advisors to aid the French in the first Indochina War. The Vietnamese call that the French War. 
Well, our direct involvement started in 1964 and, as I said, lasted uh, formally until 1973. The Vietnam War is still commonly considered the longest war that the U.S. has ever been involved in its, in its entire history. Uh, the death statistics are staggering. Uh, in battle, 47,434. Non-combat were 10,786, giving us the total in-theater fatalities that you often hear quoted of 58,220. But in reality, 1.3 million military deaths occurred if you count the tally in all the countries on both sides that were involved in that conflict. And tragically, there were also 1 million civilian deaths. Some, such as Carl Marlantes, believe that something else died there in Vietnam as well. In an article he wrote last year called Vietnam, the War That Killed Trust in the New York Times, he said America didn't just lose the war and the lives of 58,000 young men and women. Vietnam changed us as a country, in many ways for the worse. It made us cynical and distrustful of our institutions, especially of government. For many people, it eroded the notion once nearly universal, that part of being an American was serving your country. He said, we have switched from naivete to cynicism. One could argue that they are opposites, but I think not. With naivete, you risk disillusionment, which is what happened to him and to many of his generation. Cynicism, however, stops you before you start. It alienates us from the government, a phrase that today connotes a bureaucratic quagmire. And he goes on to conclude, it threatens democracy because it destroys the power of the people to even want to make change. I think it's fair to acknowledge that we all became a nation divided during the Vietnam War, but in a way all wars are divisive. In the dark and pungent military humor common to all battlefields, it was said then, it's a shitty war, but it's the only war we've got. Yet within the horrors of it all, there was also a thread of service and sacrifice. Former Senator Jim Webb reminds us that despite our beliefs to the contrary, the war was not fought mostly by reluctant draftees. Nine million men served during the Vietnam War at various times, and two-thirds of those were volunteers rather than draftees. Seventy-three percent of the casualties were volunteers. He also reminds us of the sacrifices of the combat troops in Vietnam when he says, there is a belief by some that this was a war where bombs inflicted the most, most of the damage from afar, but it was the most costly war the U.S. Marine Corps has ever fought, five times as many dead as World War I, three times more dead than Korea, and more casualties total than even World War II. All across America last weekend, Memorial Day, our grateful nation came together to honor these men and women. Some celebrated, most quite unknown, but each a patriot and a hero. Some we knew personally and others not at all. For me, they are wingmen and flight instructors, men with whom I laughed and cried and whom I still see in my mind's eye as I walk the black marble wall of the Vietnam Memorial, or as I find on a closet shelf in a box of decades-old treasures, the POW MIA bracelet that still bears their name. Amongst those tangible memories, I find the things I treasure most are those pictures with people in them. I find myself staring at once familiar faces crouched behind a row of flight helmets, squinting into a Southeast Asian sun in front of a freshly painted jet fighter. It is a moment decades old and frozen in time of fresh faces, palpable excitement, and unspoken bonds. I smile at our long past youth. I sadly note those who are no longer with us, and I marvel, yes, marvel, at how far those of us left have traveled in so few years. And I wonder if those who were not a part of it can ever really understand. But in Vietnam, the press tried to help the American people understand. 
Compared to wars before and since, they were given unprecedented access. In Vietnam, if you had the courage and the stamina, you could go anywhere, said George Esper, who spent 10 years in Southeast Asia and wrote more words on the war than any other reporter. But the media's freedom to cover the war had some lasting harm, including journalists killed on the battlefield. As has already been noted by Eric, there was also resentment from the military establishment, which didn't always appreciate what was written. This built a sense of annoyance with the press that has persisted through all the wars since then, said Richard Pyle, now regrettably deceased. In Vietnam, anybody that you could get a hold of would generally talk to you, one reporter said after a panel discussion some years ago. I don't think that in our lifetimes, we will ever see that kind of freedom again. But the presence of the press, with all its appropriateness and relatively unfettered access, in covering the story of a generation, ultimately became a part of the story itself. In a book he authored in 1990 called Vietnam in the Press, Michael Carpini said, in words that capture both the horror and war of war and the ultimate toll it took on our nation, he characterizes the extremes of emotion that when taken more broadly than just the press, in those days threatened to rip our nation apart. The Vietnam War was and is a potent political symbol, a montage of discreet, contradictory, and arresting images seared into our individual and collective psyches. Buddhist monk in flames, a South Vietnamese officer coolly blowing the brains out of a captured Viet Cong, an American flag being burned. While for most, for many, Vietnam is remembered through direct personal experiences, for most people the war was and is known only through the experience mediated by others. As the primary mediator of images of the war, the press holds unparalleled power the power to help us decide what the war means. Questions about the role of the news media during the Vietnam era are as common as questions about the war itself, and in many ways are just as polarizing. Carpini pointedly concludes by asking, was the press simply the chronicler, the unbiased eyes and ears of a nation, or did it systematically distort reality? Did the press reflect the changing national mood about the war, or did it cause the shift? Did the press act as a national conscience or a national traitor? Was the press an independent voice or a mouthpiece for the White House, for radical students, or even Hanoi? Thankfully, the passions of those times have subsided. The conversations are more measured and the lessons of Vietnam recede, masked by dimming memories and lessons of more immediate and enduring conflict. But as I often remark, they're not lessons learned simply because you write them down. You must actually learn them. Something simply has to change as a result. These are brutal times. We cannot be a nation of pacifists but we can make much more intelligent distinctions between feudal wars and genuinely necessary applications of military force. Vietnam was a killing ground, but with reminders such as this exhibit, it should also be a learning ground. As Jim Mattis, Corey Shockey, and I wrote a couple of years ago here at Hoover, as a country, we have not always measured the ultimate costs of the outcomes we seek. Determining whether an outcome is worth the cost is a political judgment of enormous moral gravity. Emphasis added by the author. As Time Magazine notes, while the Vietnam War raged, roughly two decades worth of bloody and world-changing years, compelling images made their way out of the combat zone. On television screens and magazine pages around the world, Photographs told a story of a fight that only got more confusing, more devastating as it went on. The pictures from that period can help illuminate, if not eliminate, the demons of Vietnam. And in the decades since, the most striking of those images have retained their power, as we see in this exhibit. 
Think of the war in Vietnam, and the image in your mind is likely one that was first captured on film and then in the public imagination. This exhibit features a wide range of war images, both famous and forgotten. But few people have a better grasp on the role of photography in Vietnam than the photographers themselves and those reporters who lived and worked alongside them. We are delighted to have such an exceptional group with us today for the opening of this exhibit. They were there amidst it all with their own special brand of commitment, compassion, and courage. As do you, I look forward to their stories, their memories, and their lessons. Thank you. So thank you, Emeralds, and you know, thank you also for being here today at what I hope will also be a powerful learning ground. Uh, it's a real pleasure and a real honor to be part of this conversation. And I think we'll, we'll talk together probably for 25, 30 minutes, and then we'll open it up to, to questions from the floor. So there'll be lots of time for questions, and we'll just, just get underway. And I want to start with Cynthia, because Cynthia, um, you are a, a correspondent for Overseas Weekly. You were there. And I want to ask all the panelists, but I want to start with you. How and why did you find yourself in Vietnam? I just sort of dropped in one day. I was in the Far East. I lived in Hong Kong for six months. And uh, I was a graduate of Berkeley. And I was there during the, the um, Vietnam teach-ins. And I don't know if anybody here knows about those. But it, it was an all-night event where 15 minutes were given to the pro-war speakers, and then 15 minutes to the anti-war speakers, pro-anti like that. Didn't make any sense to me. Both sides sounded really um, mm, emotional and fanatic. And I wanted to know what the truth was. And having been at Berkeley in the 60s and reading the newspapers about what was going on there, the free speech movement, I didn't trust the newspapers would get anything right. So I figured if I was going to understand you know, what was going on in Vietnam, I'd have to be there myself. And my interest was really in, my, my assumption was that those young men, 18, 19, 20-year-old, that were fighting the war were going to come back and become the politicians, become you know, the um, people who make our country what it is. And I wanted to know what that war was doing to them. So I went with that curiosity. I was in Bangkok and went into a travel agency. And um, I was going to go to Angkor Wat, which was uh, Cambodia and temples. And there was a big, song, a big a poster, visit, um, what was it? Visit exciting Vietnam, land of contrasts. Oh, <laughs> yeah. Obviously before the war, but it was still there. And I said, by the way, how much does it cost to you know, go to Vietnam, be Saigon, before I go to Angkor Wat? I think it was an extra $20 or something. I thought, OK, I'll go and just go to Saigon, and find out about the war, and then leave. So I flew there, and you could not find out about the war in Saigon. It took place across the country. So I, from once, I didn't know a soul there. I was 22 years old. And um, I just took, put one foot in front of the next and said, I need press credentials. Because if I can get press credentials, I can travel on military um, aircraft anywhere. And uh, so I went around, started talking to people, asking questions. and I was introduced to Anne Bryant, who was the editor of the Overseas Weekly. And I said, you know, I really want to write. I was an English major at Berkeley, but I've never published anything. But I really want to. Will you give me a chance? And she said, absolutely. We just lost somebody. I never found out how they were lost. <laughs> hopefully, <laughs> hopefully, they were still alive. But um, she gave me an, an assignment, and I went and interviewed some people at Psychological Operations, which was on the outskirts of Saigon. They're the ones who did leaflet dropping and uh, were trying to win the hearts and minds. Uh, they did a very poor job of it, because they didn't understand those hearts and minds they were trying to win. But um, I stayed up all night, maybe two, three nights in a row, writing this on my little Olivetti portable typewriter that I brought from, um, with me terrified, and because uh, I didn't know if I could actually write a journalistic article. Handed it in 
expecting some feedback. And she said, that's fine, great. Now, now can you go do some others? And that was it. I was there for nine months, um, went, traveled all over the country, uh, didn't, wasn't interested in combat because I figured, you know, I wanted to know, I wanted to interview people and find out, you know, what was going on with them. And find, I found out a lot, not only from the enlisted men, because the, as somebody said, the, the Overseas Weekly focused on the enlisted men, mm -hmm. not the Army uh, position, but the position of those actually in the middle of mm -hmm. the activity. And um, so I lost my How long did you stay? So I was only there for nine months. Mm -hmm. But I, I, oh, I was going to say, I learned a lot also from the officers. Um, I, I really came to respect all of the people that I met. Um, and they had various points of view. And really, I left Vietnam not 100 Well, I would think I was always against the war. I, I went to Berkeley, after all. But um, I did not have that um, fanatic anti-war point of view. I had a different point of view that maybe I can talk about later. Yeah, yeah we'll definitely come that. Thank you. 69, 1969. Yeah, thanks. Phil, you came in a year earlier um, at a key turning point in the war. Can you tell us how you got to Vietnam and, and what happened when you got there? Well, I was a regular officer in the Army. Um, I grew up as a brat. Uh, my family's had someone in every war since the Spanish-American War. Mm. My generation, I think, um, venerated our parents' generation that fought the Second World War. Mm. My father was an Army officer. Uh, so I chose to go to Virginia Military Institute. The West Point curriculum in those days was all civil engineering, and I wanted to study history. So I graduated at the top 5% of my class at VMI. I was offered a regular commission, same commission coming out of the military academy at West Point. I took it, and I was commissioned in the infantry. I was assigned to the 82nd Airborne Division. I had 72 hours of leave, reported my first duty station, went through Airborne and Ranger back-to-back -back in the summer of 67 and was reassigned to the 505th Parachute Infantry. And then when the Tet Offensive began in January of 68, we were on big maneuvers in Florida. And they closed that down, airlifted us, back to, airlifted us back to Fort Bragg, put us on C-141 jet transports, and we went by Alaska, Okinawa, and down into Vietnam. If I could just tell you the arrival scenario of this, this is my first combat experience. I was the only officer on this aircraft of 180 paratroopers. All the others, most of them had been in country for a combat tour before. 101st Airborne, 173rd Airborne Brigade, 1st Cavalry. We were orbiting out over the South China Sea at about 2 o'clock in the morning. Beautiful night, stars and moon. And the aircraft commander called me up to the cockpit because I was a <laughs> ranking officer on the airplane, second lieutenant. And he said, um, we're out here because the airbase at Chula is under rocket attack. So as soon as they clear that, I'm going to make a tactical descent. I'm going to land. I'm going to lower my tail ramp and open the clamshells at the back. And I want you and all of your people off my airplane with everything you've got and get off the strip and get into the ditches on both sides because I'm going to turn that airplane around at the far end of the runway. I'm coming back up at full military power because we're getting out of there. Do you understand? I said, yes, sir. You know. Um, they did that, and it, the first thing that I noticed about it was that it was about 110 degrees at 10 o'clock at night, 95% humidity. We jumped off the airplane and made sure nothing was on the, on the runway. We jumped into the ditches, which were full of water. We were up to our chests in water. And he turned that airplane around. I've never been that close to a big jet before, but it was impressive. And then we sort of emerged from this ditch, these soaking wet sort of amphibians, you know, uh, paratroopers, and we were airlifted the next day up to the fight at Hue, which was in full swing. And we went into action that afternoon. So my experience in Vietnam was pretty cathartic. Um, I was 21 year old, second lieutenant, rifle platoon leader, had 45 troops, all of whom had been in country before. And I owe my life to them because they really took care of me in our first fights. We knew nothing about house to house fighting. Um, we're kind of inventing it as we went along. We were under the operational control of the Marines, so we were fighting under the control of the 3rd Marine Division. And uh, there's a picture in that exhibit of three correspondents on Lilloy Street, which is on the south bank of the Perfume, grossly misnamed Perfume River. Um, 
at Hue, and it's, you get an idea of the damage and the, shoot, the fighting because that, that building is just shot to pieces. And it was all like that. So that was my first experience. In here. Say a little bit, if you would. I mean, it's an interesting moment to land in the war. You know, it's a moment when American society is about to turn against the war, I think, in, in, in large numbers, after Walter Cronkite especially went on and talked about Tet. And I, I'm curious, you know, you came from a military family, you came from VMI. What were your expectations about, about fighting and about the war itself? Did you have a view of the war? Did you have a view of the Vietnamese? Did you have a view of our mission, our broader mission there? Well... I'm not sure you're going to have to speak up a little bit because I still have a hor horrible residual hearing problem. So could you sorry. restate the question? Sure. I'm, I'm very sorry. A I'm lot just, of loud I'm, noises. Sorry. I'm just interested in, in what you expected to find when you got there. Oh. You know, war, combat as an individual experience, you can't describe it. And, and the circumstances are all different. You know, my first experience in Vietnam, it's a big country. It's bigger than the state of California. It, it, everywhere you went, it was different. Hmm. So. It, it's tough to describe what you would expect. I'd heard a lot of anecdotal things from people who'd been in Vietnam and come back, and I just didn't know what to expect. I just was very afraid I wasn't going to be able to do my duty. I didn't know how I would stand up to combat. It's the visceral question that every man that goes to war in a responsible position to lead American infantry says to himself, am I going to be a coward? Am I going to be able to stand this? And what I found out was that the decision to take care of my men overrode everything else. And so my memories of some of the biggest fights I was in are all slow motion. Yeah, my, what happened with me was everything slowed down. Hmm. And it was a very odd, you know, this is, I've talked to people who've been in air crashes and police officers and first responders, and many of them have the same mm -hmm. uh, experience. And I would go to, man, I'd go, think about how, what happens in the jungle at the first burst of firing, everybody disappears. They do, they do the natural thing, which is they hit the jungle floor. The, te the textbook at Fort Benning says, the leader goes to influence the action where he can best influence. It means you've got to get up and move and find your people and then tell them what to do. And then in my case, what I would do is I would tell my men, I want you to do this. And then I'd hold them and have them repeat back what I said because they're terrified. And, and we get these reunions and they say, do you remember when Lieutenant Joy had, you know, and yeah, they remember. And um, it was just a very different experience. I, I, we had almost no contact with civilians on my first tour and almost no contact with civilians on my second because we were in areas that were so far out. It was like fighting in Yosemite National Forest mm -hmm. where the only thing you were gonna find would be animals and enemy. And the enemy we were fighting in both tours were regular North Vietnamese, not Viet Cong. They were trained, equipped, and fought very much like we did. Yeah. So I didn't know what to expect. Right. Yeah, boy, that does sound like a tough, tough run. Mai, you grew up in Vietnam, came here, and have been both a, a sort of survivor of the war and also a chronicler and an analyst of the war. Um, can you say a little bit about your background, where, where you came from, how you came to be there, and how perhaps your views of the war changed as it went along? Yes, my family um, came from North Vietnam, so, um, but in 1954, we fled to Saigon just before Ho Chi Minh, and the communists came in to take over Hanoi after the French uh, surrendered uh, Dien Bien Phu and the Geneva Accords were signed, giving the North to Ho Chi Minh. So my family, my father had worked for the French colonial administration so he was extremely afraid of reprisals. So he put us on a plane, and next thing we knew, we were in Saigon. So I grew up in Saigon. So had we stayed in the north, we would have seen the war from a very different perspective. But we were in Saigon. So I um, actually, something that Cynthia said, that the war in Vietnam was fought away from the big cities, especially uh, the capital of Saigon. So we were pretty much insulated against from the fighting, except when the war came to Saigon, like during the Tet Offensive of 1968, when the communists penetrated Saigon and attacked the US embassy and other targets. But amazingly enough, I found out more about the war by working for the RAND Corporation. Mm 
Uh, RAND Corporation, as you know, is a think tank based in Santa Monica, and it was doing all sorts of research, strategic research and otherwise. And um, in 1964, uh, the Defense Department, apparently McNamara, asked Brand to conduct research in Vietnam to find out who the Viet Cong were and what made them join, what made them fight, and if they defected, why did they leave? Because McNamara was intrigued by the enemy he was fighting in Vietnam. You know, they, these were supposed to be a ragtag band of uh, insurgents and uh, yet they were fighting back very hard against the Saigon government, supported by the power of the United States. So my job, being bilingual, was to go around the jails and the defection centers to talk to prisoners of war and defectors, and uh, suspects, refugees, um, you know, that we met in refugee centers and suspects who had been picked up through these military sweeps through the villages. You know, they were just picked up as potential Viet Cong. So that was my first, uh, shall we say, um, not brush, but my, my first look into the insurgency. And uh, that's how I found out more about the war. And the, the other time I came face to face with the consequences of the war to ordinary people was when I toured a hospital with a, a reporter who happened to be one of Hemingway's wives. Um, and she was doing a reportage, an article about the war, and she wanted to see the cost, the human cost of the war. So she wanted to tour the hospital. And again, being bilingual, I was uh, recruited to be her interpreter. So um, that's how I saw the human cost mm. of the war. And um, my family finally fled in 1975, mm. just as the communists were about to take over, the, over Saigon. Uh, they left really at the last minute. They were airlifted out of uh, Tanzanit Airport to the USS Hancock in the South China Seas. So that's how um, I ended up being in the South, and um, you know how I came to know about the war, ironically enough, through the RAND Corporation. Right. Huh. <laughs> you learned quite a lot through the RAND Corporation. Yes, yeah, I did. Yeah, yeah. Uh, because we have some limited time, I, I think we could spend all of our time inside the war years, but, but one of the things I want to do is take advantage of our time together to, to ask, um, what your time in the war zone might offer to us now in thinking about the Vietnam War. Um, what do you want future generations to know about the war based on your own experience there? And Phil, let me just start with you there. Well, I think I could preface that by saying um, the comments that Admiral Ellis made was, were absolutely right. What happened was a gigantic schism in the trust between the American people and their government the Kennedy assassination and the Vietnam War were the two cathartic events of the mid 20th century, and it really changed the country. I, I see so much cynicism among the youth today. We have, we have two daughters, one's in college and one's just going into high school, and it's really, it's really awful, heartbreaking to me to have had some of the conversations at the dinner table where they just don't trust the government at all, yep. under any circumstances. Yep. Doesn't matter which party, doesn't matter who's on TV, they just don't believe it. And, that's a really awful legacy that this, um, this example has. As, a, as far as personal, um, you know, I was an Eagle Scout. Um, I believed in all this stuff. I watched all the John Wayne movies. I don't believe any of this anymore. I mean, I really have a hard time. Soldiers don't get to choose their wars. They go to fight where the government sends them. And we went and we fought in good faith. I actually believed that uh, this was part of that peripheral holding back communism at the edges of the Cold War which was cold but incandescent around the edges where you could get yourself killed in a heartbeat. And I come back from that and that awful loss that Admiral Ellis cataloged, the loss of all of our young men on both sides. You know, this, this is, it became obvious to me at a point that we were fighting the enemy's birth rate. The, the, the soldiers that we would capture, 
wounded or not, North Vietnamese were imbued with some kind of spirit that I just didn't see. You know, it's it, I, the way I say it, and I'm an historian and I taught at the military academy at West Point, is I think these fellows had the same spirit we had in the American Revolution. They were gonna fight this to the end. Mm -hmm. They were gonna fight it out. One night out on the Cambodian border, stars were out, you could see these shooting stars going by. My radio operator, who is a volunteer, a young, young soldier, said, where is this all going? How do we win this? I said, I don't think we're going to win it. I think there's no strategy to win it. We're just going to keep fighting it on infinitum. And that's really a, that's an awful thing to bear. Um, let me that ask was a, my experience. Just yeah, let me ask a hard question on this, on this point. So Phil Caputo, who's also a veteran, um, said, you know, I went to war, I went to Vietnam, um, expecting that I would be um, like an American revolutionary soldier, working to free a population that wanted to be free. And when I got there, I found out I was a redcoat. And I, I wanted to ask if you had an experience like that, and if there was a kind of disillusioning that took place for you there, um, and if so, how you manage that today, and, and if not, how not? Disillusion came on my second tour. Um, okay. When I was in 1st Air Cavalry Division, we were operating up in the triple rain uh, canopy rainforest on the Cambodian border. 69 to 70, correct? This is 69, this is 68, uh, 69, 70, right. Yep. 68 was the Tet Offensive in 69, 70. All of my fighting, all the combat operations were in 69, all the summer and fall of 69 up on the border. And uh, I, 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 began to see, I began to see that the other thing was body count. That was what, another thing was the most disillusioning thing in the Vietnam War was the lies being told by the command that's above us about what we were affecting. I would get these radio calls as a company commander. I was 22 years old. I had a 170-man infantry company. How many did you kill in this action? And we'd give them the number. No, there had to be more than that. You know, well, there were blood trails, but the enemy would take their wounded off if they could. But I don't know how many, you know, whether they're dead or wounded or what. We'll make up a number. I'm not going to do that. And, you know, I got this sort of implicit, well, this will be reflected in your efficiency report. Yeah. I couldn't care less. I mean, I wasn't yeah. going to lie about it. Right. And, and that's a very, you know, you come out as a regular officer, Eagle Scout, right? You tell the truth, and yet you're being, you're being actively, overtly encouraged to lie about combat operations. And uh, that's not really healthy. And the men knew that, right? right? Right. So this is a legacy that we took out. And in fact, the, the Army after the Vietnam War was just terrible. I mean, you know, as an historian, there was the Army my father fought in, then there was the Cold War Army, and then there was the Vietnam Army, and then the Army right after Vietnam was, I mean, we, our national security, if it was based on that Army, was in deep danger. And then we reversed all that, and there was the Army that, right. thank heavens, we had dedicated officers who stayed in and changed it, then we had the Army of the Gulf War, right. it was very professional, and today, we have an expeditionary army that's highly trained and goes where, like, very Caesarian, you know, I mean, almost like the Roman Empire. It goes where the emperor says you go, yep. and they go. But back then, it was a very disillusioning experience for a young officer. Thank you. Thank you. That's very helpful. Yeah. I don't mean to sound bitter. I, I was very proud of my yeah. service in Vietnam, but it was an, it was an education. Right, right. Yeah. Mai, tell me a little bit more about... Um, what you might like to see us learn from the war. You've been very active writing about RAND, writing about its role in the war, um, in, in many ways telling the lessons that we need to know, both at a personal level through your memoir work, your family work, and also at a, at a, a more abstract level through the RAND work. Um, if you had a, a class at Stanford, as I do, what would you want to tell them um, based on both your studies and your, your life? Well, um, <clears throat> um, First of all, let me just add that yeah. life in Saigon was 100% safe because the communists, they didn't have heavy artillery or airplanes, but they had rockets and mortars. So once in a while, they would shell the city or they exploded bombs inside the city. But um, what I like people to remember is that um, uh, something that the Admiral said is that you know, look carefully before you apply American military might. Because, uh, you know, if you remember the context of the Vietnam War, it was during the Cold War, and we misjudged a, a war in Vietnam as a fight between communism and uh, so the South Vietnam, which is part of the, you know, so-called um, Western free wall and uh, bloc and free wall. And, uh, but actually, the Vietnam War was a continuation 
of something that had started during the Vietnam War, uh, during the French period, as the Admiral said. So uh, the United States misjudged the situation and came in and fought, um, first of all, on the wrongful assumption that it was fighting against the exp communist expansion. And <clears throat> secondly, it supported a side that had trouble winning the war. So <clears throat> I think that we should be careful in where we apply our power, but also who we supporting, because we could be, you know, wasting our country's human mm -hmm. and economic resources on something that was really not in the national interest of the United States. Mm -hmm. That said, um, I'd like to point out that at the time, the fear of communism was extremely strong among a lot of people in, Viet in South Vietnam, <clears throat> including the middle class to which my family belonged, and that we were very grateful when the United States intervened because we were very afraid of communism. You know, nowadays people can't go back that far and feel that fear, but it was extremely acute and it was very, very strong. So um, my family, of course, welcomed uh, the American intervention. And to this day, we're very grateful. So um, it's, um, but on the other hand, was it in the national interest of the United States? Of course, it was in the national, it, it was in the interest of a lot of people in Vietnam. But for a country, for the United States, was it in, in the United States interest? And I guess the answer is no especially considering where Vietnam is now, it's now an ally of the United, semi-ally of the United mm. States in right. Asia. And uh, so, I mean, it, as the Admiral said, we just have to be very cautious yeah. in um, jumping mm. into foreign conflicts. I know I can remember being a child during the war and, and feeling both um, a sense of nobility in the cause and a sense of naivete, thinking, wait a minute, what are we doing over there? I can remember both those things existing. Um, Cynthia, um, um, I was looking at your work early on preparing for today, and I kept thinking about Michael Herr. Michael Herr was a journalist um, who wrote a book called Dispatches, um, remembering his year in, in the war, and he said something that has always stuck with me. He said, you were as responsible for everything you saw as you were for everything you did. And as someone who primarily saw, who, who primarily took photographs, I'm wondering what you thought of as your responsibility when you were doing your job and whether you carry a legacy of the war inside yourself, inside the way that you see the world, um, and if so, what that legacy might be. Well, I think possibly what happened to me was I had been, I'd grown up thinking there's a right and a wrong. Mm -hmm. You know, there's a, a good war and be on the right side of the good war fight for your country, and there are wrongs. And I think that was pretty much destroyed in my mind, being mm -hmm. in Vietnam. Mm -hmm. Everybody had a different perspective. <clears throat> you know, the, the, the soldiers that I interviewed, mm -hmm. um, I remember this one guy saying, you know, I volunteered to come here, and I looked at those guys going out into the jungle, on, choosing to be on point, and they're, they're the most risky position yep. to be. And I thought they were just crazy. Who would want to do that? He said, I re-upped, I came back, and now I'm volunteering for point. Hmm. He said, I don't know what happened. Can you tell me? Hmm. And I couldn't say anything. Right. But everything was very, um, every point of view had validity, it seemed to me. Hmm. And I think what I came out of it with was, you have to use your own judgment, mm -hmm. and you have to fight for what you believe in. Mm -hmm. I think you have to do that. But mm -hmm. what you believe in may be wrong, <laughs> or it may turn out later to be wrong. Mm -hmm. But um, what else is there? You know, and traveling a lot in the world, I also came up with this, you know, I saw the different moralities of different uh, cultures. Mm -hmm. And I always thought our sense of right and wrong and morality was, was correct. Mm -hmm. But in another culture, theirs is correct and ours is not correct. Right. So I still think you have to believe in something. You have to believe in your country. You have to fight when you have to fight. But um, 
there are no absolutes. I don't, I don't believe. Mm -hmm. I don't believe that war was absolutely wrong or absolutely right. I know that from the people I interviewed, the people, the, the officers in Vietnam were not fighting the war they wanted to fight. It was being led by Washington. Mm -hmm. So, you know, everybody had their, it wasn't perfect. And I think that's what I came up with. Thank Nothing you. That, is perfect. Yeah. That seems like a, a lovely place to, to turn it over to the audience and see if we, we can field some questions from, from you all. Uh, yeah, I have a question for Mike. Yes. I, um, you know, being an American, seeing what I saw here, I really couldn't get into the minds of the people in Vietnam and what they were thinking, uh, why they were fighting. And I was just wondering, when you interviewed a lot of the people that you did for RAND, what did you find, what was their motivation? Why were they doing what they were doing, particularly the Viet Cong? Yes. Well, what motivated them was, there was several reasons, but foremost is the sense of nationalism. You know, they felt that they were fighting another bunch of foreign uh, occupiers because the history of Vietnam is one of being occupied by the Chinese, by the French, and so they just saw the Americans as a, the new, you know, a group of foreigners who come to take over the country. Uh, so nationalism was very strong. The second one is this feeling that Vietnam was unjustly divided into and they wanted to reunify the country, but they wanted to reunify the country under a government that they could believe in, and a government they thought could bring them social justice and economic equality. So they fought for, for what they describe as they put to me, what they call the just cause, Jing Hia. And so that's what really motivated them. And they were very, very, very motivated as you know, and as I found out, that that's what propelled them to victory because they had very few doubts about their cause. And as one of the people who sat in the Ken Burns documentary, in a war, the side that, have, that has the fewest doubts is the side that will win because they believe in it and they will take any sacrifice. And they did take a lot of sacrifices to achieve their objectives, but they were very motivated. Yes, uh, I just, I think we've, most of us have probably seen that marvelous uh, Ken Burns series, but I'd, I'd really much like the panelists to tell me what they thought of it and if they particularly have found any weaknesses or any great strengths. Yeah, me too. I, I, will, I will take a, I'll take moderator's privilege and, and, and offer a brief answer. I'd like to hear from the panelists on it. Um, one of the things that has concerned me the most about the war, um, as it's been recalled in, in, in memories, that we've, we've, in many settings, um, retold the story as a, tor as a story of personal experience. The thing that pained me about that documentary was the absence of historians, by and large, my accepted. Um, there was a relative absence of historians on the screen. Um, I thought it was a very rich documentary. I thought it was a, a long way forward from where we were 20 years ago. Um, but I was pained to see um, less historical framing um, than I would have liked. Ken is a storyteller. So what his purpose is to tell the story of the Vietnam War through the personal experiences of people like Phil. So it was very much, you know, a more emotional uh, um, uh, retelling of the, the Vietnam War. What I liked about it as, as a Vietnamese is that it gave voice to the Vietnamese on all sides. Mm -hmm. And uh, yep. that's a very rare because I've yeah. seen a lot of documentaries and the Vietnam War is usually treated as an American experience, seen through the eyes of Americans. But Ken did make an effort uh, to interview Vietnamese on all sides of the, of the war and, uh, uh, and in a very even-handed way, I thought. Um, though some Vietnamese American might disagree with me, but I thought he tried to be objective, um, as he as he said in many forums that uh, I was part of. I went with him to some events for, to promote the, the documentary. He said his objective is not to put his thumb on the scale of history and just to let the stories tell the story of the Vietnam War. So um, from that point of view, I like it very much. 
Um, of course, even at 18 hours, it cannot cover everything in death. And to, in my mind, um, he might have put, he, I think, focused a little bit too much on the North Vietnamese and the Americans, you know, the war between the North Vietnamese regulars and the Americans, and less on the Viet Cong, the insurgents, who took the brunt of the war up until the Tet Offensive when they were, you know, decimated by the American and South Vietnamese counterattacks. So to me, that is a weakness. But on the whole, um, I'm very happy with it. Phil? I'm sorry. I saw the half of the first one, and it was so emotional that I just could not watch it. Well, there were pretty emotional points in that thing. I mean, mm. when um, I, one thing about my experience is I never had a chance to talk to the other side, mm. the enemy, either VC or North Vietnamese. We always passed them through. We would capture them or medically treat them and evacuate them to the rear. In the years after, I just dreamed about being able to sit down across the table with a bottle of scotch with some guy that I fought against at Hue and talk to him. And Lynn Novick did that. She actually called me up and said, we found two, one was a VC and the other was an NVA political officer who had been in the battle. The uh, VC was the same age I was at the same time. We've interviewed these two fellows and I'm not gonna tell you what they said until I show you this embargoed piece of film. And what they did was they, the North always denied that they had massacred civilians at Hawaii. Yeah. And we had American ac academicians like Noam Chomsky, who also denied that that was a CIA construct and everything. Well, I stood knee deep in this ditch full of 130 people, civilians, mm -hmm. men, women, and children, West German dentists who'd been killed by the North Vietnamese and VC and buried out. We found the first of these big mass graves. It's a really horrible day. And um, so I know that the North Vietnamese and VC did this because it was right after the battle. Um, we sat down, Lynn Novick and I got together at the St. Francis Yacht Club up in the city, the most un unbelievably ironic place <laughs> to see this film. Uh, because outside the window is a beautiful sunset of the Golden Gate Bridge, and I'm half asking myself, how did I arrive in this place after being and watching this video? But these two, and the, NV, the, the, VC, the former VC, both of them in Vietnam now, the, the former VC said we were instructed to kill them because we had we had come out, we had, we had emerged. You know, when you're a VC, you're kind of in the closet, right? You know, you, your neighbors might not even know you're a VC. But we had emerged, we were front fighters. We were fighting in the city. And our neighbors saw us, they knew who we were. And we were told to kill them because we couldn't leave the legacy of that being identifies. That's one, it was really amazing. Uh, and the other, and he, and he said, I think I'm gonna get in trouble for saying this. If you remember this on the documentary, he said, I could get in trouble for saying this. And my heart goes out to this guy. Because Vietnam is still a communist country, and you know they don't take. The one thing they did was they opened it up and let Lynn and her team go everywhere. And then the political officer said it was an atrocity, and we did it. And you know that sort of lifted a big weight from my shoulders because all these years I actually gave sworn testimony to the Army CID that we had seen what we saw. They wanted to make a categorical statement that we, those of us who had been in that ditch and exhumed those bodies, had seen it, had done it. I was still a regular officer at the time. But all the years since, I, I read these accounts that, you know, oh, the enemy never did that. And I knew the truth of it. And what the documentary did was it lifted that veil. Yeah. And it was, a, as, as you say, it was a great way to look at the other side. And I agree with Mai that it was a Vietnamese war and the Americans co-opted it in 1965 mm -hmm. and turned it into an American war. Now, my father was in OSS in the Second World War. And I know for a fact that there's a bit of a timeline difference here. Our involvement in Vietnam began in 1944-45 when we parachuted an OSS team in to help Ho Chi Minh fight the Japanese. I've met the medic on that team who saved Ho Chi Minh's life. When they arrived, he was dying of what the military calls a fever of unknown origin, probably a combination of malaria and dysentery. But they brought him back from death and the Americans really were on his side. They believed at the end when he declared the Vietnam, Vietnam to be an independent state in 1945, all the OSS people on that team thought, all right. And Frank, here's another thing as a historian. 
Franklin Roosevelt had lived, French would have never gone back into Vietnam. Mm -hmm. He was totally anti-colonial about that, and he despised Charles de Gaulle. There was no way he was going to let the French back in, but Truman did as an accommodation because of a number of other things that were going on. And so the war went on from there, and our experience went on from there. I remember that Ho Chi Minh um, was fond of quoting the American Declaration of Independence mm -hmm. um, in the late 40s. which is That document, by the way, disappeared. The State Department says it, it never received it. They got it. I've seen the, it went to, it went to the message center in Hawaii by our OSS people encrypted and sent it. And where it went from there, nobody knows. But they didn't, they said they never received it in Washington. I've seen the, I've seen the message logs in the National Archive. That document was received in Hawaii, but whether it was forwarded or not, don't know. Some time ago, I remember reading a book called uh, The Lost Mandate of Heaven. And in that, I, I came away from it with the idea that the American leadership at the time had really undercut uh, the Vietnamese leadership. And I'd just be interested in your comments about that book. Well, I, I haven't yes, I mean, we, we, we deposed Siam. Um, it was an American engineered coup. And what replaced him was a junta of generals that just went on and on from there, and then the, the Vietnamese government that was stood up after, the, um, after that was, you know, we were always basic, uh, America's like an elephant. Wherever we go in the world, we break things, and, and this was a very <laughs> fragile, you know, it's not a pejorative comment, it's just objective, and, and uh, this was a very fragile environment, and um, the ZM government, for better or for worse, I mean, it had its, it had its problems. You know, they were very pressing on the Buddhists, it was a Catholic regime in a largely Buddhist country. Um, the man himself was a bit of a Mandarin. He was a very highly educated uh, civil servant. And uh, his government was thrown out by the Americans. Kennedy was aghast when he learned that instead of being given safe passage the way they had agreed that he would be given, he was murdered in the back of an armored personnel carrier. John Kennedy turned white, got up, walked out of the room. I, I think Kennedy was very disillusioned at that time. And there's an audio tape in the Kennedy Library. I've heard it. Um, there was a fact-finding trip where McNamara and, and um, uh, General Taylor had gone to Vietnam, and Taylor was a personal advisor to the president. They'd co both come back, and on the audio, um, Secretary McNamara is, is, is heard saying, this is uh, October, this is an NSC conference in October 1963. Kennedy was killed several weeks later. We need to get out of Vietnam, and this is a way to do it. And Kennedy said, well, let's go ahead and don't make a public statement about it. And they issued a single-page document called National Security Action Memo 263, which dictated that the first 1,000 U.S. advisors come out of Vietnam by December 31 that year, and everybody would come out by the beginning of 65. He was going to get through the 64 election. He saw it as a losing proposition. There was a whole panoply of reasons for this, but I was brought up on it by George Bundy when I was at Georgetown. He was on my orals board at the Foreign Service School, and he took me aside and just read me into the entire situation in 1963. He said the president was prepared to withdraw from Vietnam. It wasn't the biggest thing happening in those days. We only had some 15,000 advisors in country. And whether or not Vietnam rose or fell wasn't the big issue. He was focused on nuclear disarmament, and he had begun back-channel conversations with Khrushchev. They were both terrified about what had happened the year before, 62, the Cuban Missile Crisis. We'd come that close to nuclear war, and that was the biggest thing on his plate. And he died three weeks after they issued that memo. Lyndon Johnson revoked it 48 hours after that, issued his own National Security Action Memo, and the war took off from there. Now, that's a fact. Hi. Uh, thank you all so much. Uh, I wanted to just uh, tell you a little bit about why I'm here and, and, and add a, a personal and, and human uh, note. Um, I'm making a film about my brother who died in Saigon in 1972. Um, he worked at the Overseas Weekly, and I have an item of his that's in the exhibition that we're about to see. Um, my film is called Jimmy in Saigon. He died when he was 24 years old. Uh, I was five years old, so I'm kind of getting to know the brother that I never knew. Um, but he had been in the Army. Uh, he was at Benoit and, and finished his tour of duty, came back to the United States, and then went back to Saigon as a civilian and lived in Saigon in 1971 and 1972. 
And one of the things that I'm trying to do in my film is really retrace his steps. And uh, he had actually become uh, really in love with Vietnamese culture, and he had become fluent in Vietnamese and was living with a Vietnamese family and uh, was very close to this family. And uh, my mom, in fact, corresponded with the family uh, after his death until 1975. Uh, now there's no trace left of this family, and I've gone back to Vietnam, to Saigon, to film. Um, one of, I have just basically two questions, and it's a little bit, it's not, it's sort of a rhetorical question, but um, how does one find missing Vietnamese people who have disappeared after 1975? Um, and I've, I've looked a lot in the United States. I mean, I think that there might be some clues they may be alive or dead, but I'm pretty passionate about this. Um, and the second is that he wrote a number of articles in the Overseas Weekly in 1971 and 72, and I've been working with the staff here, but there's a, a whole bunch of um, months that are missing that nobody has copies of. So um, if anyone knows anyone who might have uh, missing issues of the Overseas Weekly from Saigon in 71 and 72, mm -hmm. He did write articles uh, during that time. So uh, that's, that's it, I guess. Thanks. Mm. So how might we find folks we don't know where they are after 75? Mai, you're probably the only person who could, could help answer that. I, I would say it would be very difficult because after the war ended, um, a lot of people were dispersed into the countryside. And um, God knows where they could be. They might have fled by boat, by land, you know, across into Cambodia and Thailand. They might be living in the United States, so, you know. Um, is there somewhere you can advertise asking for information, maybe Facebook? I really don't know. That's great. Yeah, and even a physical, you know, Saigon, Vietnam is changing so fast. They're tearing down a lot of buildings. Even when I go back, I don't find places where we used to live because buildings have been torn down, replaced by high rises and so on. It's yeah. changing very, very fast physically. So I would say you face a pretty difficult job, but I hope there's a solution. Maybe you can run an ad in the Vietnamese newspaper, Vietnamese Facebook uh, yeah. somehow. So I, I think we'll have to take that, that one offline. I, I want to close with something that Mai has said and something that she wrote. She said, the past is prologue. The past influences the present because the present is formed by threads of history as well as by the current forces shaping societies and countries. And I hope that in our conversation today, we've raised a question. Um, and the question is something like, uh, what kind of future might our experience and new understanding of the Vietnam War prepare us for? Thank you very much for being here. Thank you to our panelists. Thank you. For being here.